My name is Bruno Silva, and I'll be introducing our next sp speaker. We're going to be talking about game dev without border, how to break out of logo boundaries. We're going to hear from Henrique Olivieres, co-founder and game gamer in chief from Bossa Studios. In this outstanding panel, Bossa Studios co-founder Henrique Olivieres brings to the table his successful transnational experience and speaks about how to make a game reach a global audience through community management, influencer marketing, and business development with platforms. A nearness discussion focused on dis debunking myths around the challenges and problems faced by devs and publishers. So let's hear about this gamer in chief. Hello, Henrique. Hello, great to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Sharing my screen with you. Let me get started because I have a lot to cover and I have very few minutes. So let's start. My name is Henrique Olivieres. I'm founder of Bossa Studios and chairman of Tiny Build. Surgeon Simulator is one of our games. I am Bread is another game of ours where you want to become a toast. I've got three decades of experience building games. I started with very low end computers. I used cassette tapes and I have built different games, arcade, mobile, RPGs, such as RoomScape and others. And I was awarded many times because of these games. I achieved commercial success and great critics. During this talk, I wanted to talk about my experience. I wanted to tell you what I wish I'd known when I started back in the day. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to cover many of the questions that you may have for the Latin American market. Now, this presentation is divided into three main pillars. First is the baseline. This is knowledge that can be applied to any country. These are the lessons I learned that can be used by different companies at any situation. Part number two, local versus global. So we'll look into what applies to Latin America, Brazil, and Argentina. Now, why is this important? Because many countries are under the same situation. But think of Poland for one. Poland started way later after the US and Japan, but now they have world-class games such as The Witcher, Superhot, Frostman, all these games are world-class. They don't like behind the two games developed in the US, UK, and Japan, but they started as late as we did. Thirdly, open conversation. This is the third part of my talk. I'll be addressing the questions that you send me. Please make sure be candid. Don't be shy. This is your time to ask your questions, okay? So just go for it. We'll be digging into your questions and answering as many as we can. So let's start with the baseline. I'll talk about experiences that are applicable to any country at any context. First thing you have to think about is technology. That's the foundation of all games. In the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, games evolved alongside with technology. They would compete for players' attention. Sonic was created by Mega Drive to show how many sprites could be rolled out in the same screen. PlayStation and CD storage allowed rendered animations to be portrayed, but now technology is a commodity. You can debate, you know, you can say that Xbox is better than PlayStation 5, but other people will buy Nintendo Switch. So we have to see technology as a tool. It has to serve a purpose. Don't think about what you can do with the technology per se. Now, why is that important? Game developers, when working on a game feature, usually think that the feature is ready to go because it was present in their GDD. They don't really consider whether or not the game will be fun. 
say, well, you know, the feature works, it looks great, but players just don't like it. So keep that in mind. You have to use technology to create things gamers are looking for. The second greatest mistakes in emerging countries, and that happened in Poland, by the way, is trying to create your own engine. No one survives that, but that is a very common mistake. Don't do it. There are many engines available. You know, Unity, Unreal, Rally, Kodo. You don't really have to create this whole new engine from scratch. Third mistake, code refactoring. You will always look back and say, well, I wish I'd done this better. Many devs will just stop developing their game to go back to their code and to refactor that. But the time you spend doing that will rarely pay off. I've seen many studies and many studios that tried to refactor their code. Very few of them could really solve the problems they were trying to. Another important tip, just use mature technologies. Do not try out better technologies. If you try to build technologies or games upon technologies that are changing their SDK or APIs, this will be harder for you. I know this is quite sexy. They'll tell you that, you know, this is a great platform for this and that reason. They will give you a great proposition, but just use technologies you can rely on. And finally, use technologies to create games. Think of level editor for one. Develop that with players in mind. That will be better for your team and you will also be able to apply that for gamers too. Now production in Brazil, we got this emerging market and we do not have consolidated experience as compared to other countries. Producers are key to your process. Remember that. They don't really have to be a producer that only works with production. They can be a programmer as well. They can be a dev. You know, the best way to learn is to use other people's money. You know, I work at, let's say I work at Ubisoft. I can learn from the mistakes people made in other companies and then do my own thing. Most studios in Brazil are indie studios. So you won't really have access to this experience. So you have to learn from other people, you know, looking at post-mortems or reading team management documents. You can learn so much from them. Now you have to be aware that you will always be one step behind those people who had years of experience in different large studios. You will have to try and find a way to keep up. Number two, project scope. In new studios, they want to do a bunch of things. They got so many ideas, but many of them can't be executed. Now the best way to handle that problem is to try and make the game work in your MVP or minimum viable product. And then when that works, you start adding layers on top of that. So that get to a point where you want to get. Instead of launching many unfinished features and expanding the game, not really knowing where you want to go, try to do this. Now, remember the 80-20 rule. When you get to 80% of a feature, 80% of accomplishment, when you think you're almost there, you're actually at 50% because this final 20% will be hard for you to finish. You'll have to tweak a couple of things. So when you think you're almost done, you're actually in the middle of the process. Now, number four, timing. You are competing against the large global studios. Your team has to be totally in line. If something's not working, you have to replace the person. You know, you need people who are on board and going towards the same direction all the time. 
Sometimes that happens. Sometimes people are not on the same page. You know, this is a harsh reality, but you have to handle that as well. Business. When people are starting to develop a game, they ask me, what kind of deal can I expect from publishers? Here are some ideas for you. These are not precise ideas, but I think they can be a good guideline for you as you talk to publishers or investors. If your project hasn't yet been developed, if your project is on paper only, if you are looking for someone to fund 100% of your game, probably 70% of the revenue will be for publishers and 20% for you. That means that they will only start sharing revenue with you after they have seen the return of their own investment. If your game is playable already, if you can see, see some aspects of the game, you can negotiate that. You can start with the 70-30% ratio from the first sale on. If you've got a community to your game, let's say you crowdfunded your initiative, then you can reduce that ratio, that revenue share ratio. You can reach 50-50. Now, if your project is halfway already, you will certainly get yourself a 50-50 deal. Now, if your project is about to be launched, then anything goes, but no publisher will work with less than 30% because they will invest in marketing, they will invest in launching your game. If they want less than 30% of your share, they will probably not pay a lot of attention to your project. Let's say they their share is 10%, but at another game, their share is 50%, they will certainly pay more attention to this other game, and therefore they won't really care for your project. So. 30% is the least you'll be able to get to get the best out of it. Marketing is also something I get a lot of us questions about what I do, where I'm going. And I always say that marketing starts the on the first day you create the game. When you first sat down to work on your game, you start talking about it with an audience and just move on from there. The other thing is that you have to work on your audience every single day, just like you work on your game. We also work with influencers, the greatest ones, and their role, remember that it's to entertain their audience. So if your game is compatible to their audience, if you ask, they're going to talk about your game. You don't have even to pay for that. But if you don't want to pay for influencers for several reasons, but basically if you pay them, it doesn't mean, it means that, that your game is not for a, their audience. Otherwise, they'd be doing it. And then you have somebody who's playing your game, is not compatible with the audience, is not that committed to the success of, of the game. And they're just doing it because they're getting paid. And this is not good for you because that's not where your audience is. And if you want to be seen, the most important thing to be highlighted is to execute the unexpected. Let me give you a basic example when I talk about unexpected. When we launched the game and the, the Surgeon Simulator in iOS, we thought everybody has seen this. What are we going to do? So we invited all these journalists to a dinner. When they arrived, it was a fancy dinner. They had to eat, they had to eat from the operating table. The food was on the patient. Drinks were uh, poured from syringes. And they never forgot that. So we, we got what we wanted, something cheap, simple, and everybody left in awe. So it's different. And because it's different, we got what we wanted. And lastly, before we move on, it's concept and ideas. It's very common to think about, to think that your idea is revolutionary and the idea itself is going to result in a great game. But I have sad news for you. Most of the ideas we have are horrible, and I'll tell you why and why I know that. At Bosa, Bosa, we have game jams every day. We stop the studios for 48 hours, and we have around 70 employees. So we have around 10 teams, 
And during those two days, we play around 10 games. We do that every month and per year, about 100 games. Those games, in the minds of the developers and the teams, the, the games were amazing. They decided they were going to create the game. They were excited and, and, and hyped about it and invested, created the prototype, played for, for two days, and they realized it wasn't that great. So maybe one or two actually go into production. In other words, 98 games are games that aren't that great. The ideas are not that good. Second point is execution. It's 10% idea, 90% execution. And the example that I always use is Nabokler Drop. Probably you never heard about it, but it's exactly what the game is all about. The team that created the game was hired by uh, GameView and created the portal with them. The only difference here is production, the experience of the team that developed it. They were paired with the uh, guys from Valve and developed the game everybody knows, but the initial idea was the same. And the initial idea created a game that wasn't that great. So don't forget that your idea is valuable, but it's just a small part of the maze of the, of the puzzle. So create a prototype, play, play it, start from scratch. Don't get married to that idea because if you do, you're going to have a bad experience. And most of the time your ideas are not the right ones. And I actually discovered that with my team. So this is the part that is important for, for Brazil. I'm, I'm rushing through this because I don't have a lot of time, but value of experience is really important. You are competing. You, games are created by people who are, have been in the business for over 30 years. They've seen what you saw. They know what you know, but your advantage is that you can stay hungry. You know that you don't know that much and you can develop new ways of solving problems and continue learning from others and especially from each other. Don't be shy, put your egos aside. Poland is super successful in, de in game development because all of Poland, the Polish scene comes from a single company, CD Projekt. They started seeding talents that left the company and started new studios. So they all know each other. And because they know each other, they exchange a lot of information. They're very open. And that's what accelerated CD Projekt. And in Brazil and Argentina, it's really important for you to tell the stories that didn't work, what was wrong, what you did and didn't work so that others don't repeat your mistakes. This is the only way that you can actually accelerate development to reach international level. And lastly, mentors is an invaluable resource. When I started BOSA, I had three mentors, Will Livingston, uh, founder of uh, Idols, and I brought in David Alpik, founder of, uh, founder of Criterion, with, that made Burnout and etc. He's an investor of uh, in several companies with GTA and everything uh, you already know. And the value that these people added to my company is in, uh, is invaluable. If I would give them a lot more, if I could go back in time. So it's important for you to talk with mentors, have mentors and have people who are going to work like working with you. This is a really valuable experience for, for a studio. Global topics. I think this is important, especially here in Brazil because Brazilian culture is so strong, so rich with a very strong tendency of using Brazilian culture to create a game. And this can be done, but it's very risky. You need to be aware and know very well the risk you're taking. Just an example, in 2000, the most popular game in Brazil was Counter-Strike. And today you can't find CS Hill as a, an official map in Counter-Strike, Counter Grow a Counter-Strike source. It's available for download, but it wasn't integrated because CS Hill doesn't travel. It doesn't, it's just very culturally connected to Brazil. All Brazilians liked playing it, not because it was culture, because it was a good map, but they, it didn't go anywhere. Another important thing is to be able to explain your game, its function, what it is, what it's about in a single sentence. For example, I am Bredeshista, 
it's a slice of bread that wants to become toast. That's it. And that goes around the world because you start telling that story and you pitch to journalists. And if you have to explain something in a paragraph or two, it's going to be just a lot harder. And third, you need to piggyback on what's going on around the world. For example, the uh, executive product of, of Alham, excellent game, more than 5 million copies sold uh, in a month. And they, and he was explaining that the global culture uh, helped a lot because you have Vikings on Amazon Prime, Thor, and Loki on the in, in, in the Avengers universe. So everybody knows about Vikings, and we piggybacked on that. And topics like cancer, that dragon is a very small game made by a single person, but went around the world because it touches people who have some contact with this type of reality, people who have been, uh, who have lost the uh, loved ones to cancer and being able to play this type of game that touches on these topics. It's a very uh, important, it's a very uh, memorable experience for these people and you have to t speak a language that everybody understands or shares or has in co have in common your team is also very important and this is what i took the most time to to learn as a professional i started working with friends i was a coder i was a game designer i was a producer and i was very much able to hire somebody who was not fully prepared by that position, thinking that I could complement or add what was lacking. But I have my own work to do. And thinking that I could do other people's work is just childish. It doesn't work. It's very difficult for you to do that. So you need to work with people who are fully competent on what they are doing. Don't hire people thinking that you can help them do their work, because this is going to impact your work. You're not going to do your work well. and and you will not be successful in trying to help that person. There's also that other saying that uh, tell me who you uh, who you relate yourself with and I'll tell you who you are. But it, people who are good, good professionals will work with anybody. So you need to surround yourself with the best people and you have to become the best version of yourself, learning from others, understanding your own limitations and correcting your limitations so that you and your team can become the best version of yourselves. Remember that you are competing with other teams around the world where you're competing with the best. Gamers don't want to n play bad games. They want good games. So you need to have the same type of professionalism that everybody has in any other area. And finally, half of the good opportunities that I had as a professional were because of other people that I knew. So build your network. It's much easier for my for me to hire somebody who can solve a problem for me than I ha than I solving the problem myself. But if I know a lot of people and their uh, and their expertise. That's it, my problem is solved. You don't have to know how much somebody is going to offer you in a deal if you already know somebody who went through that type of deal. So every chance you have to strengthen your network, especially here in Brazil, where there is a young opportunity, offer that opportunity. If you can go to GDC in San Francisco, probably next year, do that, get to know everybody know people who share your passions and who share your problems. I was going to talk a lot about investment, but that's a little bit more complicated. And I thought I'd have a little bit more time and I don't, I only have another five minutes. So I'm going to skip the, through this, but if you want to contact me later to ask me about investment or any other topic, you'll have my email at the end of the presentation. I'll be very much willing to work with you. So, Let's open the mics here. All right, so we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go through some questions. We got a lot of questions. So for the first game, do you advise focusing on gameplay itself or focusing on narrative, just gameplay, because narrative is always more complex and more expensive. When you talk about uh, different types of mechanics, these, these are 
for example, the survival game, it's very basic. Collect, multi -invent put together an inventory, assimilate your collection to new items and objects. You're going to create content with these types of mechanics. The narratives and content are always more difficult and more expensive, and unless it's a very basic game, like a platform game, then you can use the narrative. But creating content, creating the narrative is much more difficult than creating good mechanics. For example, Portal. All right, so to wrap up, something that actually goes back to your, your presentation, when, it, when a game is not really working, should we just quit or continue? How do we know when to stop? Engagement, that's how you'll know. If you have few people playing your game, but those few people are playing a lot, you have a reach and an audience issue, and you can solve that. But if you have a problem with your game with several people coming in, play for two years and never come back, so your game has an essential fundamental flaw, and it's going to be very difficult to fix. Just as difficult as creating a new game, for example, Nomadac, when, when it first launched, it's super problematic. People were just not staying on the game. They invested over two years to create a better game. So they decided to maintain their track on that game. So they insisted because some people were really, really great fans. But the big play here is engagement. If you have people who love your game, it's worth continuing investing. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time. I really wanted to continue here. We have a lot of questions, but thanks, Enhiki, for your participation. It was really great. So big festival sessions are amazing. Stay tuned. We have a lot to see till midnight. Don't forget to share the link, like, and ask your friends, invite your friends to uh, participate. We'll be back in a few minutes for the next session. Big Festival 2021, the biggest games festival in Latin America.